In this second DNA replication video, we're going to focus on the modes of DNA replication, the proteins that are involved, then also turn to a third section talking about the main differences in eukaryotic and prokaryotic DNA replication. Very briefly, I'm going to focus on prokaryotic DNA replication, and then we're going to turn to eukaryotic more. So when prokaryotes replicate their DNA, they undergo a type of replication called theta replication, just, excuse me, just like the Greek letter theta. And so you could see here that eukaryotes simply, simply have an origin of replication, and then at that origin of replication, a replication fork uh, forms uh, on either side of something called the re replication bubble. And replication proceeds in both directions. So it goes this way, and then also it goes this way, until both of those replication uh, forks meet, and then you have the whole chromosome replicated, and it looks like this theta structure. Uh, eventually, those two uh, sections that are intertwined are separated, and you have the two completely replicated chromosomes. I'm being rather vague uh, on that part of the talk today because we're not going to really focus on that. I just want to give you the contrast between that and then uh, the linear replication that occurs in eukaryotic organisms such as humans. You can see that in humans we have these replication bubbles, but we have multiple replication bu bubbles per chromosome. Prokaryotes on the top only have one replication uh, bubble. Humans or other eukaryotes have three, four, five, you know, probably hundreds of them. And the reason is, is because the genome is too large uh, to have one replication bubble and have it replicate in the appropriate amount of time. So in eukaryotes, you need these multiple replication bubbles that happen. If we look at DNA replication, DNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that replicates DNA, synthesizes DNA in the five prime to three prime direction. So in other words, if we're looking at the diagram, if this strand highlighted in blue is the old strand, or in other words, the template strand, we call it, the new strand of DNA that's being currently replicated on this slide uh, would be replicated by DNA polymerase, and the polymerase would be going this way. It would be going down. Uh, and the reason is, is because the DNA polymerase needs something called a free, F-R-E-E, -E, three, T-H-R-E-E, -E, prime hydroxyl group. So a free three prime hydroxyl group uh, in order to latch on and put the next base on. So when you say DNA replication proceeds in the five prime to three prime direction, you have to realize that you have to give perspective on that. So you have to say that the new strand that's being formed forms in the five prime to three prime direction. If you're looking at the old strand, obviously it's sort of opposite, right? In the reference of the old strand, you're going three to five. But we never report it that way. We always say the new strand is being replicated in the five prime to three prime direction. So this is zooming in on a replication bubble. And what I'd like to do over the series of next few slides is, is start with a basic replication bubble and then add players onto it. So each slide that comes after this slide will add a little bit more. Uh, the strand of DNA that is replicated continuously is called the leading strand. Uh, and that's because you can see that this red strand here is going 5 prime to 3 prime. So DNA polymerase can keep replicating it no problem. The opposite strand is something called the lagging strand. Here, DNA polymerase could not go to the left, like I'm moving the cursor right now, because it would be the wrong way, right? DNA polymerase has to be going this way, 5 prime to 3 prime, in reference to the new strand. But the problem is this. The whole show is going this way. The replication bubble is opening this way. Oops, back up one. It's opening to the left. So if it is opening to the left, you could see that the first DNA that it has access to is the DNA that's down here, right? Because that had been opened first. And that's why you run into this problem here on the lagging strand. And the problem is, is that you can't have DNA replicate continuously in the direction the fork is going. Rather, DNA polymerase hops on and forms these short little fragments of DNA uh, being replicated in the opposite direction. And those fragments are called Okasaki fragments. There's four main steps to DNA replication. There's initiation, unwinding of the double helix, elongation, then termination. Let's start talking about some of the players and what they are. The origin of DNA replication is just the sequence of DNA that states, hey, start replicating here. The first thing that happens is uh, this red sphere, or something called an initiator protein, uh, latches onto the DNA, opens the replication bubble, and basically says, okay, I've identified the origin of replication. Next, a second enzyme hops on called DNA helicase, and its job is to unwind the double helix. Now you might think, well, what happens if the DNA helix unwinds? 
Well, the strands are going to go right back together again right away through hydrogen bonding. So there's got to be some type of protein that prevents the DNA strands from hydrogen bonding together again. And those proteins are these little clusters of grape-like structures uh, that are called single-stranded single binding proteins. What they do is they hop on and they temporarily keep the two strands separated. Another enzyme that's involved is something called DNA gyrase. Uh, gyrase comes from the Greek word yido, and yido yido in Greek means go around and around. And the reason why DNA gyrase is, is here is that it relieves something called supercoiling. In other words, it relieves the tension um, that the helix experiences downstream here. You might say, what tension is this? Well, if DNA helicase is unwinding the DNA helix here, it's going to be putting tension downstream that DNA gyrase has to relieve. Uh, the best analogy, which is slowly fading as time goes on, but if you take an old telephone cord and it's all tangled on top of itself and you pull the, the tangle apart from one end, yeah, you might separate it, but you're going to build up major tension downstream. So these are some of the players that are involved. Uh, DNA polymerase is obviously the enzyme that physically replicates DNA that adds the bases on. If we go a bit further here, and again, I'm just going to talk about things on this slide uh, that I've added since the previous slide. So if something's on here from before, I'm not going to you know, harp on it. Uh, this would be a great slide to study from. Uh, if you want to get rid of the previous two, all the info that I introduced you to on the previous two slides is actually on this slide. So this would be a great one to study from. Just a few more things to add then. Uh, for DNA polymerase to start replication, it needs a free 3' hydroxyl like we mentioned before. How does that happen in nature? Well, an enzyme called primase comes in and it lands on the DNA and it synthesizes a very short RNA primer, uh, maybe like five base pairs long. That RNA primer has a free 3' hydroxyl group which allows DNA polymerase to hop on and start replicating. So the RNA primer is in green right here in the middle section. The DNA polymer, excuse me, the DNA is in red, which the DNA polymerase had added. What happens then because of that is you'll see that the end product when you replicate the DNA has a bunch of RNA primers speckled into it. Those primers are things that have to be removed before the DNA replication can be complete. In prokaryotes, uh, E. coli specifically, there's about five DNA polymerases. Uh, you do want to know all five of these polymerases, and you want to know their functions. So you want to know this chart. Uh, the two main superstars, though, if we really were to zoom in, are DNA polymerase 1, DNA polymerase 3. When we say DNA replicates, you could see here that DNA polymerase 3, when we say it replicates, that's the one we're really thinking of. Uh, DNA polymerase 3 elongates the DNA. That's the one that replicates almost all the DNA. It has very high processivity, is the word we use. And processivity means that uh, the DNA polymerase can stay on a long time and keep replicating the DNA forever. Uh, DNA polymerase 1, on the other hand, has lower processivity, but what it does is it removes and replaces the RNA primers. So you do have a, a complete, you know, intact DNA double helix. Some other terms to notice here. Uh, we already talked about 5' to 3' polymerization, or how the, you know, the DNA is made. There's two other terms, though. Some of these enzymes have 3' to 5' exonuclease activity. Some of them have 5' to 3' exonuclease activity. Exo in Greek means outside. Nuclease means to degrade DNA. So what that's saying is these enzymes can degrade at the end of the DNA strand uh, if a mistake were made. That's what exonuclease means. And so it tells you which of these enzymes have which activity. So this is a chart that you do want to know the whole chart for. Okay, uh, RNA primers, primers must be replaced. This picture here is just showing you a visual of what I, what I described on the previous slide, where when we replicate DNA, we have RNA primers speckled throughout. Then we have our DNA in red here. DNA polymerase number one is going to hop on and remove that RNA primer, uh, replace it. Oops, sorry, replace it with um, you know an actual uh, piece of DNA. Then what happens later on is there'll be a little nick here, though. There'll be a part of the strand where um, the two uh, backbones of the DNA segments are not linked together. At the very bottom of the screen in D, you'll see that an enzyme called DNA ligase comes in, and it seals the deal. In other words, it seals the bond between those uh, backbone fragments, and then you've completed DNA replication. So what are the main differences between eukaryotic and, DNA, sorry, uh, eukaryotic and prokaryotic DNA replication? Uh, there's three main things that we want to focus on here. So uh, basically, um, 
eukaryotes have a larger genome, right? They have a larger genome. Uh, since they have a larger genome, they need multiple origins of replication just to replicate the DNA in the amount of time uh, that it takes, so the amount of time it has within the cell cycle. Number two is eukaryotic chromosomes are linear, and then eukaryotic chromosomes are also associated with nucleosomes, which have to dissociate and then resociate to allow DNA replication to happen. If we look at all these um, different replication bubbles in eukaryotic DNA replication, you can see it's sort of a chaotic scene. We have to make sure that each replication bubble only replicates once per cell cycle. In other words, you can't be having some DNA replicating two, three times in a cell cycle and another piece of DNA or segment of DNA replicating once or maybe not replicating at all. So to, to um, sort of deal with this issue, um, something called licensing happens. Um, and it's a very good analogy, actually, because just like if you buy computer software, you're buying a license, like one for each computer. Uh, the same thing happens here. Each replication origin is licensed once per cell cycle to allow um, you know, DNA replication to occur. The name of the protein, or it's actually a complex, it's a bunch of proteins put together that allows this licensing to take place, is it's called MCM, or mini chromosome maintenance complex. It'll license the site, allow it to replicate, and it'll sort of be hopping, you know, it'll hop off. Then before it can hop on, hop on again uh, to license it a second time, a different protein called geminin binds to MCM and prevents it from relicensing the same site. So that's a way that uh, eukaryotes have to avoid, uh, you know, having the same segment of DNA replicate twice per cell cycle. Quick clicker question for you. When you look at this cell, something we did before, so from many lectures ago, but you want to make sure you remember how many chromosomes are here? Are they duplicated? Are they unduplicated? How many sister chromatids are here? What's that dotted line down the center of the cell? What are those two little, uh, little uh, squares at the end of each pole of the cell? Those are different questions that you'd want to be able to address on this uh, clicker question. Okay, now one final thing to consider about DNA replication is that there's an end replication problem. If you think about it, at the very end of the chromosome, there's going to be a gap that happens. And this gap has occurred when a primer is removed, but there's no free 3' prime hydroxyl to allow polymerase to finish replicating the DNA. This end replication problem is solved by an enzyme called telomerase. Uh, and telomerase, I think of as, reminds me of, uh, I don't know, sort of the movie uh, The Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's an old movie. Uh, it reminds me of that because DNA, uh, excuse me, uh, telomerase is, is uh, half nucleic acid, half protein. That's the kind of enzyme it is, very strange enzyme. In other words, um, it has an RNA template, and then that huge sphere that you see in the background is actually a protein structure. So what DNA telomerase does is it'll, it'll hybridize to the DNA overhang on the bottom strand in this picture. And what it does is it allows uh, DNA polymerase to hop on and extend the strand that was already too long to start with. So it's almost at first glance, you think it's not even fixing the problem uh, if you look at you know C, because it extended the strand that was already too long anyway. What's gonna happen then uh, is telomerase is gonna sort of you know move over to the left continue the replication process, move over to the left again, continue the replication process. That's what happens in D and E. And again, it seems like what is this enzyme doing? It's not quite solving the problem. It's just making that one strand longer. If we flip to the next slide, though, we can see eventually uh, telomerase is going to hop off. You have this long overhang. But then what's going to happen on the right-hand side of the picture is this long overhang is going to basically wrap around itself, and DNA is going to continue to replicate to fill in the gaps that were created on the other strand. And what happens basically is, and we've alluded to this before earlier in the course, is that although, although our chromosomes are linear, the telomeres or the end of our chromosomes are circular. And the previous slide and this slide show you exactly the mechanism by which that happens. This is a very famous discovery and actually the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2009 uh, for physiology and medicine. You know based on the discovery of telomerase. So very, very important uh, enzyme. Okay, again, quick clicker question for you. Go ahead and look at that, think about it. Uh, if you have questions on this, you're not sure what the answer is, you know, phone a friend or please do come to my office hours. I'd be happy to help you with it. This slide here is actually showing you that nucleosomes um, disassemble and reassemble very quickly after DNA replication occurs. Uh, and the reason we know that is you'll see these different replication bubbles here. Here's one, 
here's another one here's a huge one over here and you can see that the 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 beads on a string or those histones are still there so now obviously they had to release at some point or at least loosen from the dna to allow polymerase to come in and actually replicate the dna but we still see the histones there as the bubble is expanding excuse me and if the replication bubble expands and we still see it there the inference is that uh, the histones dissociated and resociated to the DNA very shortly after replication. Uh, this experiment here actually shows that uh, it's something we're not going to cover in our course. So I put it up there just sort of FYI, but I'm not going to test you on this slide. Uh, if you are curious about it, please come to our office hours. I'd be happy to explain to you further. Okay, and that basically takes us through the end of DNA replication 2. I uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture. These are terms that you'd like to know, these bolded terms, as well as the other things we discussed. Any questions on these terms, uh, please do let me know.